Hello, it's your boy Davidos. I did an MCU marathon that was like 18 episodes long, like in 2018, I think. It was from Iron Man to Black Panther, every single movie. Black Panther was a separate spoiler talk video, so I'm gonna like upload these into like from 18 videos to three really long ones. So you're seeing one of them right now, and I'll do phase one, phase two, and Civil War to Black Panther. So whichever one you're seeing, you can watch it if you want. You don't have to, but it is a re-upload from a main channel. So if you want to see the full marathon in its normal entirety, then you can see on the main channel. I'll probably link it down below. So yeah, enjoy. It's time for Civil War. Now, I'm actually Team Captain America. I'm actually, I'm still Team Captain America right now, but... Um, there was two different covers. I bought the Iron Man one because it just looks cooler, okay? But I'm Team Cap. So when I first saw this movie with my granddad back in 2016 on day one, I'm pretty sure, I sort of overhyped it. I said it was the best MCU movie. Now that was, for me, I was overrating it, I feel. I was overrating it. I guess I was so excited by it and I loved it so much that I thought it was the best MCU movie. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I still think it's very good. Like, I still think it's a good movie. I just don't think it's like the best MCU movie, but still uh, very good. Although considering it's called Civil War, it felt more like a civil dispute for three days because <laughs> that's more or less what it was. Captain America, Civil Free Day Dispute. Yeah, that, that, that's a more accurate title, but still I'm not hating on it, of course. It was a very good movie. It was done very well. And uh, if I was to rate it, I'd probably still give it a 9, 9, 9 out of 10. 9 out of 10, I think. I think it's a good movie. Um, maybe 9 is a bit too nice. Maybe 8.5 at the least. But um, yeah, I still think it's a really good movie. I just don't think it's the best MCU movie. Although, it's arguably top 5, I think. Maybe. It's definitely top 10. Easily top 10. But top 5, I think, probably. Maybe. We'll see. I'll do a rankings list soon. So, you, you'll see you see where I put it in that. But yeah. Um, it has a lot of talking points. Though. A lot of talking points. And yeah. Uh, this was the better Avengers movie than Age of Ultron. <laughs> um, although this is this is more a Captain America movie more than anything. I mean it's I mean not just because of the title but because it's very much Captain America story when you think about it. Even though it involves a lot of Avengers, you see what I mean. But yeah, um, as I said, a lot of talking point there's a book of course where if someone says the words it mind controlled Winter Soldier, we get that at the start. And he's on a mission for December 16th, 1991. Now, that's a memorable date, which we find out what's the significance of it at the end of the movie. But yeah, um, he's being mind controlled to uh, go and kill a couple people and steal something. So yeah, there's that. That's the opening scene, I'm pretty sure. Then you get the Avengers mission, uh, Wanda. Um, well, it ends, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a really cool like chase scene, fight scene. Then Wanda ends up accidentally destroying a building which kills Wakandans so that is a really bad and sad thing and that prompts General Ross from the Hulk from the Incredible Hulk movie he comes to the Avengers, Avengers uh, facility and he says we can't tolerate this anymore you, you, you need to sign these Sokovia Accords it means that you have to um, you can only operate under UN supervision and that's only if they let you operate so yeah, there's the, basically for the UN to control them, basically. Although it doesn't sound as bad as that, but you know what I mean. The, but then they have the disagreement between them. Um, half of them want to sign, half of them don't, you know, ETC. Both sides make good points. I feel, honestly, I feel both sides make very good points. I am Team Cap because personally I wouldn't trust the UN or the US or whatever. I wouldn't trust them because, well, you never know what their agendas are. Their agendas change, ETC, and sometimes they might like refuse to send the Avengers to somewhere where they might send them and you know it, it could also get infiltrated you know just like you get inf infiltrated so you, you can I can understand Cap's standpoint you know on all of this especially after S.H.I.E.L.D. as well and yeah um, but still the other side also has some really good points to, there's a good point for both sides and yeah um, obviously you get that whole argument and uh, yeah, then Peggy Carter, obviously she dies, so uh, she, you don't see her die, but you see her funeral. And then Sharon comes and talks, and this is the first time that, Sharon, that Captain finds out that Sharon is Peggy Carter's niece. So uh, this whole time he's been fancying uh, her niece, which is, is quite weird, right? Like, he was in love with Peggy Carter in World War II, got frozen, and now he's going to get with his niece, get with her niece after, after she's dead. It's, it just feels... It just seems really weird. But obviously, General Ross says if you refuse to sign the, accord, the accords, you have to retire. Otherwise, 
you'd be operating illegally. So yeah, there's that as well, which is a bit harsh, but yeah. You obviously get Zemo. Obviously Zemo's the mastermind behind all of this. He finds that book, which you can mind control Winter Soldier with. You have to say some words. Homecoming's a word. Fright car, I think is a word. He says multiple words. And once he's said the whole phrase, Winter Soldier is mind controlled. And he's, yeah. The, the, that's, that's scary. That is scary. But yeah, uh, he gets the book, of course, and um, it all leads to U the UN meeting uh, for the Sokovia Accords. And it, and obviously there's a bomb explosion. Now, Winter Soldier is framed for this. At, at, at the start, you think Winter Soldier's done it. He's been mind controlled again. But in the later on, later on in the movie, you find out that Zemo used someone similar, similar looking to Bucky Barnes to frame him. But this whole time Zemo was behind all, all of it. So yeah, there's that as well. We'll get to that later. We find out not now, but later. But I thought, I thought I'd mention it now. But yeah, obviously um, everyone thinks Bucky did it. T'Challa, Black Panther, we get his introduction. Um, he knows, uh, he, I mean, he thinks that Bucky did it as well, obviously. And um, yeah, uh, I think, when, when does Black Panther happen? I'm pretty sure it's in, in this time period. Like, I'm pretty sure it starts before Black Panther takes place and finishes somewhere after, I think. Obviously, T'Challa's dad died as well in that UN explosion. So there's, he was blinded by a little bit of rage, but also because everyone was thinking it was him anyway. So either way, but yeah, obviously his father dying was a major factor to him going after Bucky. And yeah, obviously you get that whole chase scene. Captain America stops a grenade with his shield. That is, a, for me, I think there might be a callback to the first Avenger when he jumped on top jumped of a grenade to stop it. So I think uh, it's kind of a reference in a way. I think Black Panther does it as well in his movie. So yeah, I think that's like a Marvel thing now. S sort of, sort of, I guess. But anyway, you get that whole chase scene. Really well done scene. The fight scenes in this movie are great. Uh, that chase is done really well, and then T'Challa, Captain Falcon, and um, Bucky, they all get arrested, they all get caught, they all are taken to Berlin where Tony's there, um, Black Widow's there. Anyway, Zemo has a plan, he, obviously the guy who he killed is uh, the one who's supposed to uh, interrogate Bucky Barnes, and uh, well, Zemo interrogates him instead, and uh, he puts on a plan to send a bomb to the Transformers. Not 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 the movie Transformers. I mean like um, electricity Transformers. You, you know what you know what I mean. Okay, explode. There's an explosion there which cuts off the power to the city, and uh, this allows Zemo to. Uh, well, everyone's blind to him now, and he uses the book on Bucky, and uh, mind controls Bucky obviously, and um, Bucky ends up fighting Captain America and Falcon and Tony, and T'Challa, and Black Widow, and Sharon Carter. He, he fights them all off somehow, and then uh, escapes with Captain America. Captain America tries to get him, but he escapes with Captain America, so does Falcon, and they're all fugitives at this point. And yeah, um, then you get the scene where you see Nightmare off credit scene, you get the extended version of the scene, and uh, yeah, obviously Bucky now remembers him. And then he, sh he mentions that there's other Winter Soldiers, there's more than one, and Zemo wants to get to them. And um, yeah, eventually, well, Cap realizes that they have to go and find these other Winter Soldiers and, and I don't know, get rid of them, I guess. And uh, yeah, obviously there's only three of them. There's Tony and uh, Black Widow, obviously, uh, on, on the other side of things, of course. And uh, yeah, then you get your, see, all these scenes of uh, putting both teams together, basically. So yeah, you get Spider-Man's introduction. That was done really well. You get Hawkeye coming to the Avengers facility to uh, get Wanda. Um, Wanda takes out Vision, they escape together. Black Widow gets Black Panther, gets T'Challa obviously. Sharon um, gets Captain America and Falcon's uh, costumes back because they confiscated those, confiscated the costumes and the shield and stuff. Sharon got them back and then, uh, well, Cap ki kisses Sharon, so now we know they're, they're together. It's a bit weird, but I, I, I guess it makes sense in a way. Um, they get Ant-Man, I think that's the last scene of getting the team together. And uh, yeah, eventually it's that, that airport battle, of course. Um, arguably the best superhero fight scene ever. Um, arguably, arguably. I'm probably, I mean, Infinity will probably be, probably have a better one. But definitely the best Marvel one. Yeah, definitely the best Marvel one. Let's just put it that way. It was the longest, I think. The longest superhero movie fight scene, I'm pretty sure. I think they'll be beating Infinity War, but is it might be the longest fight scene in all movies? Actually, no. The Expendables, the Expendables movies must have longer fight scenes because 
the whole movie is a fight scene in those. So, uh, probably not the longest fight scene in movies, but one of the longest, and probably the longest in superhero movies. It was just amazingly done. From the great action, to the, the nice little comedy, nice little jokes, to the interaction, interaction between characters, like Captain and Spider-Man, that was cool. Uh, Panther and Bucky, you, there was a lot of cool exchanges, you know, between them, so yeah. It was all done well, and it all ends in Cap and Bucky escaping, the other four getting caught in, on Cap's team, and uh, Vision accidentally shooting uh, Rhodes. Rhodes smashes into the ground, obviously, and um, yeah. A lot of people got annoyed that no one died in this, like it was very serious, no one died. I have a major issue with it, I mean, they're, pre they're preparing for Infinity War. So obviously like, they tend to weaken villains, ETC, to like, progress the story of the MCU and um, they don't kill many people off, they do kill, they did, they did kill Quicksilver to be fair, but yeah, just one, just one guy killed off in a lot of movies. I get people's frustrations with that, but you know, just keep them alive, you know, you want, let's be honest, you want as many of them, as many of them as possible for Infinity War, you don't really want them all to die, you know, you, you when you get to Infinity War, that's when you need as much as you can, and yeah, the more heroes in that, the better. So I'm glad he didn't die. So yeah, the dead body of uh, the Bucky Barnes lookalike is, well, I guess it's a lookalike, um, it is found, and Tony finds out that Captain, well, Captain was trying to tell him that it wasn't Bucky, and Captain realizes that, okay, he realizes with the dead body that he was framed, Bucky was framed uh, for the bombing and everything else. And then Tony's like, oh no. So he goes to this prison, underwater prison, holding Falcon, Ant-Man, um, Wanda, Wanda and, and Hawkeye. And they're being held in prison and uh, Tony disables the, uh, the speaker systems and he tries to get location because he realizes that uh, they were right. And then Tony finds it out. Formula One outside or something. Anyway, he finds it out. He goes to where Captain is to go and help. Uh, Panther is closely following as well. He's in the air. He sees Iron Man where he's going. He follows. So yeah, um, it sets up a, a massive finale. So yeah, Zemo finds the facility with the uh, other Winter Soldiers. He actually kills them all. So there's that. So yeah, Iron Man, Cap and Bucky, they find Zemo. They want to take him down and um, Obviously, Panther is there around the corner, and he realizes from their conversation that Zemo was the one who killed those innocent people. That it wasn't Bucky. So this whole time, he was trying to kill the wrong man, and uh, he kind of finds out that he was blinded a little bit by rage, in a way. And uh, yeah, it's just very interesting for Panther's story arc, and it's just very interesting introduction to the character in general. You know, introduce him emotion with an emotional introduction. You know, that's just it, it was done well. You know, and with the other introduction, Spider-Man introduction, that was done well too, but that was more lighter toned, which is fine, because that suits Spider-Man, but yeah, I really like the way they introduced Black Panther in this movie. Anyway, um, Zemo eventually plays the clip of December 16th, is it the si December 16th, uh, I can't see, yeah, December 16th, 1991, and it shows the mission, it shows the car crash of uh, Tony's parents, so Tony's watching this, and it shows Bucky murdering his parents. And yeah, that is, that is deep. Obviously he doesn't like, he doesn't walk, I mean, he's, he's mind controlled. Like he, he obviously Tony, Tony should know this, but with Soldier Bucky, he's mind controlled in this movie. He's, he's under mind control, under the influence, but Tony can't accept that. The way he sees it, Bucky's the guy that killed his parents. So he starts fighting with Captain and Bucky. And yeah, they have this massive fight, of course. And in the middle you get Panther finding Zemo and um, Zemo tells him about the Sokovia fight in Age of Ultron, how Zemo's family, his father, wife and child, they all died and um, he wanted revenge. But instead of trying to fight them, he wanted to tear them apart from the inside and he used that video to destroy them. And he used this, this, this whole thing, this whole thing was to destroy the Avengers. And in a way, he succeeded. The camera cut off. Sorry, apologies for that. I don't know where it cut off, but hopefully, it hopefully got the whole thing in. Anyway, uh, the rest you, it cuts back to the rest of the Iron Man v Captain America fight, and then eventually, Iron Man has him in a position. He rips Bucky's arm off, of course. So there's that as well. Bucky's lost his arm. Bucky's on the floor. Uh, Iron Man's beating up his Captain America, of course. And Captain America gets up and he's like, "Well, Iron Man's like, stay down." Captain's like, 
I can do this all day. And that is a great callback to the first Avenger. It was just an amazing callback and Bucky saves him. So that is an even better callback to the first Avenger. Just a bit of deja vu, but on a more epic level. Bucky's distraction manages to help Captain win the fight. So Steve is in just a complicated position because, well, his friends, he was friends with Tony's dad in World War II, but his best mate in the army and his best mate in, in his life, Bucky, under my control, killed Tony's dad. And he's also friends with Tony. So that's just like, that is so confusing. And then eventually you get to Ross, not not Ross, what's his name? What's uh, Martin Freeman's character's name? Whatever his name is, he's in Black Panther as well. He, um, he, he, he catches Zemo and he tells Zemo that you went through all that effort to fail and Zemo said, did I fail? He makes a good point. He did tear the Avengers apart, you know, he did that. And even though he's not a great villain, his motives were understandable. His motives like like not understandable, but his motives were actually like serious. Like you, you, you could see why he was doing what he was doing. So then you get the ending scene, Captain America's letter to Tony, if you need me, I will be there. And obviously uh, Tony, I think in Infinity War will obviously need him. And uh, yeah, I'm assuming he calls him at some point because uh, well, when when people are in Wakanda, I'm pretty sure like Captain and uh, Black Widow, they, I guess they, because you see them coming back to Wakanda, so I'm guessing they find out what happens. Maybe Tony calls them or something and they go to Wakanda to, I guess, get some help or warn them. I don't know. We'll see what happens in that movie, but um, yeah, it's pretty cool. And also Cap breaks the Avengers out of the prison, the, the four that are arrested. They've been broken out of prison, so there's that as well. Then you get onto the after credit scenes. Uh, the first one, Bucky and Cap are in Wakanda. Obviously, Bucky's getting frozen because they need to get the Hydra stuff out of his head, and he and he's still in his head now. And um, as long as he's alive, he's still a threat to people around him and even himself. So he wants to be frozen until they find a solution in Wakanda. Obviously, they got advanced technology over there, so they will find it eventually, I guess. And um, yeah. Uh, T'Challa's obviously helping him because he realizes now that Bucky wasn't behind it really and uh, yeah um, he's happy to help so I'm guessing like during Black Panther Captain America I'm pretty sure is like he's there somewhere maybe he's on a mission somewhere who knows and probably like I guess Captain like he goes to break out of break Avengers out of prison right I'm guessing he takes them to Wakanda actually he takes I'm guessing he takes Wanda to Wakanda. Who else does he take? Falcon, I guess. And I guess Ant-Man goes home because he gets his own movie. And where does Ant-Man take part? I don't know. Maybe Ant-Man takes place before... Ant-Man 2, I mean, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Maybe it takes place before, in, before Infinity War, I guess. Even though it's after in the movie. I don't know. We'll find out, I guess, as well. But yeah, um, the second scene, the after credit scene, was uh, Spider-Man. He uh, discovers some new powers on his suit and yeah that was done pretty well too so yeah uh, great movie great introductions to Black Panther and Spider-Man it was done perfectly for both of them um, great fight scenes good story and yeah just an all-round good movie although it didn't feel like a war haven't even opened this yet time to watch it so Doctor Strange is a similar type of movie to Iron Man not type of movie sorry similar type of plot in a way in some ways anyway it's, it's definitely very different to Iron Man of course this uh, has a lot more sorcery and magic and yeah this movie is done uh, very well 8 out of 10 I'd say and yeah I've seen it before obviously I've seen them all before but yeah this movie was uh, a surprise I don't know who he was before this movie so this was a really good introduction to the character and yeah it was just really cool it was just really cool but let's talk about the movie you get your introduction to Chrysalis who is the villain of this movie He's basically an evil version of Doctor Strange pretty much I mean when you look at it when you think about it then you cut to Strange he's a cocky doctor he's so cocky and confident he always succeeds he wants he, he doesn't like failure he wants to succeed and he does he su succeeds all the time then he gets in a car crash and he loses uh, purpose and loses Loses ability in his hands, he starts shaking and stuff, operation, and he, he just doesn't go well. And uh, yeah, then eventually um, he finds out about someone who used to be paralyzed, and he goes to that person and he asks, how, how can you walk again? What happened? And he talks about, talks about Kamataj. Kamataj is where the Ancient One resides, where all the sorcery stuff is. And yeah, so Strange spends the rest of his money, because he spent all his money trying to find a cure for his hands, but he couldn't find it. Spend whatever he had left to find Kamacharge 
And yeah, the ancient one shows him a lot of things, but he's cocky and disrespectful. And she says, no, I will not teach you these things. He gets kicked out, but eventually gets let back, again, let back in, obviously, because Mordo convinces her. And yeah, he gets his training. Now, I'm pretty sure the time span of this movie takes place over a few years. I'm pretty sure. Like, there's no way he learns everything in like a few days. I think, I don't know how long this movie is, but in terms of the time frame, I reckon like, it's just a few years, take place over a few years, in, I reckon. Like by the time the movie ends, he's probably like three years, four years older, I reckon. So yeah, you get introduction to Wong. Wong is a uh, rather funny character. We'll see him in Infinity War as well again. Um, he also finds the Eye of Agamotto, which has the Time Stone in it, the Infinity Stone, the fifth Infinity Stone. There's just one left now, which we, have, we, we don't know where it is yet. But yeah, that was the fifth Infinity Stone to turn up. And um, this is the most simple stone to be explained. It controls time. So yeah, he finds out in a book about a dark dimension and Dormammu and eternal life. Not in the way he thinks, but eternal life. Then you get the fight between Gaecilius and Doctor Strange. Only The only real fight they have, to be fair. Like, the only like proper fight that, that they fight each other. And then the Cloak of Levitation, his cape, chooses him. Obviously, over there, there's lots of relics over there. And... In, and Eventually, when you're ready, after your training, not after training is done, but when you're ready, your relic will choose you. And the Cloak of, Re Cloak of Levitation chose Doctor Strange. And yeah, it was a pretty cool moment, happened during the fight. But then uh, Strange obviously got injured, had to go to the hospital, um, got healed of course, but yeah, um, that obviously stalled him. Then you have, um, you have him come back, because Kaecilius made him realise that the Ancient One is using the Dark Dimension to keep herself alive, which is not a good thing. She's been lying to all the sorcerers. She's been doing what she says is forbidden and she's hypocritical. And um, Strange tried to tell, she, Strange tried to tell Mordo about it and Mordo doesn't believe him, obviously. Mordo has a lot of faith in the ancient one. Then you get that massive chase scene, Mordo and it, Doctor Strange with Caecilius and the villains. And then Strange is about to die, ancient one saves them using the dark dimension so now Mordo has seen it he's seen for himself in person that Strange was right and um, it's like everything for him was a lie to him and it's just hit him hard like to see that she's been doing this thing this whole time when she's been specifically telling everyone you can't do this by the way did I mention that I watched this with my granddad in 2016 I usually like I usually say this in every episode like when I watched it who with BTC but yeah anyway Caecilius then kills the ancient one Doctor Strange, well, actually, what, what, I'm sorry, I was reading, reading the next line on, on my notes. Um, Caecilius kills the Ancient One, then, well, she dies in hospital, of course. But then eventually, let's fast forward to the final battle. Doctor Strange, he doesn't fight um, Caecilius because the Dark Dimension, Dormammu, is already there to take the world away. But Doctor Strange uses the Time Stone to reverse everything. Because um, he can like do, like, it's not like time travel, you don't just go back in time. He uses it to uh, reverse. If, you, if you've if you seen it, then you know what I mean. But if you haven't seen it and you're just listening for whatever reason, he uses his power to like, he can reverse things, you know. He, he can look at an apple and eat an apple and, uh, and, and, eat an apple and, and uh, turn it back to time and you have a full apple again. That was poorly worded, but I think you know what I mean. He sees a lot of destruction, he reverses it and the destruction goes back to where it is. But eventually he finds out that, well, he has to go up to the Dark Dimension to stop all this. And he goes to Domamu and he does that I come to bargain thing. <laughs> he puts Domamu in a time loop until he gets sick of it and he wants to be released. And Doctor Strange says, leave Earth, take your minions, never come back. And uh, yeah, um, and I, I will stop this time loop. So obviously Caecilius wanted eternal life in the Dark Dimension. Apparently it gives you eternal life and it does. But not in, a way, not in the way you think. It's like going into some dark hell. And uh, it's, it's not on fire, but you get to go in the dark dimension and live there and you suffer for the rest of your life. And yeah, he gets taken in by Dormammu and Dormammu leaves. He uh, agrees to the deal that Doctor Strange makes. And yeah, um, that is the end of that. And that is the climax pretty much. And yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's one of the few movies in the MCU that climax is not on a battle, but on like... A conversation, if that makes sense. Maybe the only one that does that because all the MCU movies just end on some massive final battle sequence. This was very different and um, I just liked how it was done. It also brought something new to the MCU. Obviously, it's hard to bring something new when you're 13 movies, actually 14 movies in to a superhero universe. 
but they managed that. They somehow managed something different and it works. Also there's another thing, Mordo, um, he disagrees with the way that Strange uses time because you can create other things. Obviously, I understand that, like if you mess with time, things can drastically change. I know that from watching The Flash, okay? And, and in real life that would be like, if you could do it in real life, it would affect things as well. So I understand everything's standpoint. And Mordo is just like, I, I, can't, I can't be a part of this. And he leaves. And yeah, the movie ends a few scenes after. Then you get your after credit scene, uh, which was Thor. Thor turning up, Doctor Strange uh, mentions how him and Loki are on Earth. Um, there's Joan Ragnarok, of course. And uh, they're looking for Odin, and uh, Doctor Strange says, allow me to help you. So um, that sets up his cameo in uh, Infinity, no, sorry. His cameo in Thor Ragnarok, which will come around a year later from that point, I think. So yeah, that is a pretty cool thing to do. And uh, the Mordo scene, uh, second half of credit scene, he finds the man who used to be paralyzed. Mordo goes and visits this guy and uh, paralyzes him again. So the guy was paralyzed, he got healed, by the ancient one, he uses magic to walk just for Mordor to take it away. Mordor just took it away from him, and he's paralyzed again. I don't know if he dies because uh, he is alive when you when you see him, but um, if no one helps him, could have a problem there. But uh, yeah, Mordo does take him down, and I'm assuming they do a Doctor Strange two with Mordo as the villain. Guardians assemble. Yeah, I know no one says that, but I thought I'd just say assemble because it sounds cool and they'll be in Avengers, although they don't really need to assemble because they're already together, so yeah, this makes no sense, but yeah, uh, <laughs> let's just start the video. The weakest MCU movie in phase three, not not the worst MCU movie, it's not terrible. I mean, it's not, it's, it's okay. It's it's um, above average, above average. It's, 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 it's enjoyable, but it's got a weak plot overall, to be honest, and the villain is that last stuff. Like most Marvel movies, to be fair, but yeah, um, this one, Nowhere near as good as the first one, I feel. It's, it was still good though. Um, they put a lot of jokes in it. Probably this one and Ragnarok, they overloaded the most with, with comedy. It's not the worst thing. I mean, it worked, for Ragnarok, it worked for Ragnarok, but for this movie, sometimes it felt like more like a comedy movie than a superhero movie, which it's fine though, it's fine. As long as the plot is good, but the plot wasn't that good. And the villain wasn't very good either. But it does have talking points and has emotional moments as well as some serious moments. To be fair, the funny scenes are quite funny. Not gonna not gonna mention them really, but um, I'm just gonna say like most of the comedy scenes, they're funny. <laughs> they're, they're funny to watch. Some of the interaction between characters, it's just it's it's just so funny. But anyway, uh, let's talk about the main parts of the movie. So you see Star Wars parents first of all. You see Star Wars dad for the first time, and then you get the opening fight scene with that big monster. That was a pretty cool scene. Then they go to that. Uh, they're working for gold people. Whatever they're called, they call the sovereign, right? I'm gonna call them gold people. I'm gonna call them. I'm gonna call them golden company, because it just sounds better, okay? And um, in exchange for taking out the monster and protecting their their batteries, um, they give they have Nebula. They they give Nebula back to the Guardians, back to Gamora. Gamora wants to take it back to Xander. And yeah, Nebula is their prisoner. They leave Rocket steal some batteries, which you'll live to regret because um, the golden company they. They want to go and get, they go after the Guardians now because they know that they've stolen from them. So yeah, this whole movie they're chasing the Guardians just because, just because of some batteries, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit petty, it's a bit petty, but yeah, they turn up like a couple scenes and yeah, um, straight away actually, um, they start chasing them. They escape because Ego um, shot their jets out of the sky and uh, yeah, eventually they meet Ego and um, it was an epic chase scene, by the way, but yeah, there's a Star Wars reference as well when they're going through the asteroids and uh, Jackson says you need to be the best pilot in the galaxy to be able to get through that and uh, it, it's a reference to Star Wars when you think about it, it's a reference to a scene I'm pretty sure. But yeah, uh, let's fast forward, Peter, Gamora and Drax, they go with Ego to Ego's planet, Rocket stays with the ship because they crash landed on, on a planet, the ship is half broken. So Rock is fixing it, Groot's still there, Nebula's in, in prison, still there, and um, the rest of them have gone with Ego, uh, the living planet. So yeah, there's it's two two sides of the plot, I guess. But obviously the movie's about Peter's dad, Peter Quill's dad, so obviously eventually all, they all end up together. So yeah, but we'll get to that point eventually though. But yeah, you get that scene of Yondu and Sakaar, who's played by Stallone. Uh, that was a... Uh, 
I mean, nothing much to say about that scene, but it was nice to see Stallone in a Marvel movie because I like him. Um, I don't think he's uh, like the greatest actor, but I'm a big fan of Rocky and Rambo. So to see him, to see the guy, to see Rambo himself, Rocky himself, in an MCU movie, he just looked pretty cool. And it's not a major character, but still, he looked fine. Then you get to meet Mantis, uh, Drax. Well, Drax is the funniest uh, character in the movie, actually. He, I mean, he should be more serious, to be fair, considering Thanos is not dead yet, and he's trying to avenge his wife and daughter. So he should be more serious, to be fair, but I obviously, I liked, I, I liked his, he, he was funny. So while they're all gone to Ego's planet, Rocket, gets attacked by the Ravagers, Yondu wants to take him alive or whatever, no actually what does he want to do? He wants to take him back to the Golden Company I'm pretty sure, but he disagrees and um, yeah and then Nebula kills Yondu because Nebula escapes and she kills, no what, what, am, what am I saying? She doesn't kill Yondu, am I stupid? She knocks Yondu's flipping head thing out so he can't control his arrow and uh, yeah um, there's a mutiny, obviously the Ravagers take over the ship, imprison Yondu and Rocket and Groot. Um, well, they were, were going to kill him to be fair, but Nebula said to spare him, so maybe she cares a little bit, or maybe not. Maybe she just wants to get out, I, I don't flipping know, but Nebula is not imprisoned, she's on the ship. And um, in return of capturing Yondu and Rocket and Groot, she gets a free ship, and uh, she wants to go and kill Gamora and kill Thanos. So. This leads to Nebula going towards Ego. And then you obviously get that Rocket, Yondu and Groot escape scene. That was a pretty cool scene. Really cool scene. Oh yeah, that, that's a fin. That's, the, that's what I was going to say. I said thing on his head. It's a fin. He gets a new fin, a Yondu, and they escape with Rocket and Groot. That was a really cool scene. That was a really like, really fun scene to watch. Great visuals as well, by the way. The visuals of the movie was great. So yeah, and then they're on their way to Ego as well. So eventually everyone's going to Ego. And uh, Nebula, eventually, she gets to Ego and attacks Gamora because she wants to kill her. They fight and then they spare each other's lives. The Gamora saves Nebula, ETC, and then we get the emotional moment where Nebula talks about like how Gamora w would win every fight. And because she kept losing, Thanos would rip her arm off, rip her body parts off. That, that, that's why her face is like part metal and stuff, metal arm, ETC. So yeah, it's quite brutal and um, she blames Gamora for it because it's because she lost to Gamora in every fight. And yeah, that's an emotional scene. Not the most emotional scene though, we'll get to that eventually. So then they find some skeletons, some dead bodies, Gamora and Nebula. It's a good thing they fought because they wouldn't have found it otherwise. So that's another thing to carry the plot forward. But they found dead bodies and we find out later on from Mantis that those dead bodies are Ego's children. That is crazy. Basically, Ego wants to destroy all the planets and recreate the universe and make everything him. Because he can do that, he's capable of doing that, but he needs another celestial with him because he, he's a god. So Star Lord's dad is a god, which is pretty cool. So Star Lord's like a half god, but they're both celestials now and uh, Ego needs him in order to create other things. And Ego tried to do it with other children, with all the other children. He, he tried to do it and he couldn't clearly and he killed them all. That's why they're all down there. ETC and then yeah uh, with Star-Lord he finds out that well he can actually do it with Star-Lord so yeah there's that so they have to stop the rest of the Guardians obviously the Guardians themselves plus Yondu plus Nebula plus Mantis all, all of them together have to go and destroy Ego's brain um, they have to get Star-Lord first they save Star-Lord and um, obviously you get the emotional moment first of all though um, Ego killed Star Lord's mum. How brutal is that to know that your dad put a tumour in your mum? How flipping brutal is <sighs> imagine finding that out. That is ridiculous man. That is that is that is traumatic. But yeah, um th they save Star Lord and then they go into the core of the planet with a bomb. They have to destroy his brain of course and um then the Golden Company arrive because they can track the batteries that Rocket stole. Rocket, why did you steal the batteries? You could have had... <laughs> it could have been easier, but you know, you got to carry the plot forward, I guess. But yeah, they interrupt, but eventually... Well, that, then you get the final battle eventually. And uh, it was an epic final battle. Star Lord versus uh, Ego. 
you get all the guardians taking on the uh, the golden company I guess you, you get you get all these the different um, scenes the visuals are great and uh, yeah it was just a uh, the fight scenes were fun the fight scenes were fun that's not the issue with this movie the fight scenes are fun comedy is fine it's, it's overdone a bit but the comedy is fine it suits guardians anyway but um, the plot for me just wasn't that great and the villain for me just I, I don't know what to say about the villain he just wasn't great it ends with Yondu sacrificing himself to uh, save Star-Lord Obviously the planet's burning, blowing up of course, so they got to escape, everyone else is out. Star Lord is left, Yondu takes him away and obviously there's only, there's only one like, what's it called, one cloak to uh, let you breathe in space and uh, Yondu gives it to Star Lord. And Peter, um, he watches his other dad, his actual like, because Yondu kept him away from, Yondu was hired by Ego to bring Star Lord to Ego, but after Yondu found out about the dead bodies, he chose to keep him, so you know he actually cared. And Yondu was the real father of Peter Quill, even though he wasn't biologically. But I mean, like in terms of like being there for him and raising him, Yondu was his proper father. Then you get his funerals. Then you get Nebula um, leaving the Guardian ship to go and kill Thanos. So I'm guessing we will see her arrive in Infinity War. Um, by the way, in Infinity War, the three people that if if, if Thanos dies. He won't die in Infinity War, I think he'll die in Avengers 4 next year, but if or when Thanos dies, the three people I want to see kill him most are Gamora, Nebula and Drax. Drax because of um, his, the death of his wife and daughter, Nebula because of what Thanos has done and same with Gamora, what Thanos has done and uh, it would be a poetic justice for them to be the ones to get the kill. But yeah, we'll see what happens, we'll see what happens. I just hope at least one of them is involved in the end of Thanos. So yeah, you get Yondu's funeral of course and then you get five after credit scenes. Five. Is that a record for a movie? Five after credit scenes in one movie? That is absolutely ridiculous. So first of all you get that other Ravager, what is, what's his name? He was there in the final battle but he wasn't really fighting, he was just in the ship to uh, get them all out. Um, whatever his name was, the tall skinny guy. He's quite, he's, he's quite funny to be fair. And um, he gets to control Yondu's arrow, he tries some practice and he shoots Drax accidentally in the chest so uh, that's pretty funny, then he runs away as well. In the second scene you get a scene with Stallone, so Stallone's character, nothing special there but it was again it was pretty cool to see Stallone in MCU so yeah there's that as well. Then you get the Golden Company again, they uh, introduce a new weapon and she says I shall call it Adam and obviously that is Adam Warlock, so we got a, we got a reference to Adam Warlock, a teased Adam Warlock. Apparently in the comics for Infinity War, he is a big character, but apparently won't turn up in this, in Infinity War, so I guess he's not part of him. Apparently he's a key part in the comics though, but I'm sure we'll get him in Gunning Galaxy 3. The fourth after credit scene is a teenage group, and uh, they have an argument, Star-Lord and teenage group, and <laughs> Star-Lord at the, end, at the end is like, now I know how Yondu felt, and yeah, it just looked like a proper parent to son conversation. It was quite funny. And finally, we got the final after credit scene: Stanley with the Watchers. He was in the movie earlier, and in a cameo, of course. He was informing the Watchers it, during the movie. He said, "So I was a FedEx guy, and he was a FedEx guy in Civil War. So maybe all these cameos mean something. Maybe this whole time he's been an informant." Telling the Watchers what's going on. If you don't know who the Watchers are, don't worry, don't worry. If they don't explain the MCU, you don't have to worry, but um, they watch, basically. And Stanley's apparently, they're informed. So uh, that's, a, that's a pretty cool theory, and uh, it kind of is, well, I, I don't know what to say really, but the thing is, they said it was a FedEx guy in Civil War, but Guardians of the Galaxy 2 happens a few months after Guardians of the Galaxy 1, and then after number 2, it's spread out, it's, it's sped up over a number of years and Infinity War is years after number two so that's really weird like the timeline Just saw Spider-Man Homecoming, let's talk about it Spider-Man, Spider-Man does whatever a spider can Alright so yeah, hello, <laughs> the video for Spider-Man Homecoming is here um, Nearly finished actually, two movies left so um, we have gone very fast I have anyway because um, Today I voted for The Dark World, and um, so that, that's how far ahead I am. I'm 
a long way ahead. So I loved this movie. It was good. It was a good superior movie. If I was to rate it 8 out of 10. Um, is it the best Spider-Man movie? No. Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man 2 was the best Spider-Man movie for me. Um, this one it isn't far off, but Spider-Man 2 is a lot better. That was just one of the best superhero sequels ever. One of the best up there anyway. Not the best, but one of the best super superhero sequels. And in terms of the first Spider-Man movie for Tobey Maguire, I think it's pretty neck and neck, Homecoming and Spider-Man, it's very neck and neck, I feel like Homecoming I feel is better, but it's very like very close, it's debatable But it's better than Spider-Man 3, it's better than both Amazing Spider-Man movies with, with Andrew Garfield So yeah, it's, 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 it's good, it's good, it's not the best Spider-Man movie, but it is good What I like the most about this Spider-Man is, he actually looks most like Spider-Man Why is that? Because he's actually a kid this time, he actually looks like a kid the problem with Tobey Maguire, as, as good as he was, he looked more like an adult hanging around school. He did not look like a high school kid, right? Spider-Man's supposed to be a, a school kid, okay? And Tobey Maguire, he, he was great. He was great. He just wasn't that. He just wasn't accurate enough for me. Same with Andrew Garfield as well. Same issue with him. They were both good Spider-Mans, like good as Spider-Man, but as Peter Parker, Tom Holland is the most accurate one because he's actually a high school kid in high school and that's what it's supposed to be and it just it just works really well and yeah um, I also love how he's a friendly neighbor Spider-Man for for quite a few, few scenes in this movie he helps an old woman deals with a stolen car um, stolen bike as well so yeah that's a very friendly neighbor Spider-Man thing to do that is that is Spider-Man and yeah it's good, nice to see him do that as well but yeah um, it was a good Spider-Man movie. If I was a rated eight out of ten, and yeah, let us let let us let us talk about it. We get an introduction to the villain, Michael Keaton, as the Vulture. He sees Chitauri weapons from the Avengers: Battle of New York, and um, he he wants to take those weapons, steal some weapons, and make his own weapon and sell it off. I think. And yeah, then it comes to Peter vlogging, so he he seems even more like a kid in the modern day in 2018. So that's nice as well, that's a good touch. So he wants to impress Tony Stark. He wants to join the Avengers, impress Tony Stark. So he does all these things, hoping he gets noticed. Eventually he's a bank heist, which, well, he, he does well with, but almost kills someone. Luckily he saved the guy though. That was, that was a pretty fun scene. And then his friend finding out Spider-Man as well. <laughs> that was done pretty well. So then let's fast forward to the party scene. Um, he's gonna go to a party as Spider-Man and then he gets distracted because the villains are around the corner trying to get away. He chases after them, he doesn't quite get them, he meets the Vulture, uh, the first uh, interaction between them, and the Vulture drops him into a into a lake where he's trapped, and um, Tony, who's not really there, uh, he's, he's a Tony Iron Man suit, saves him from uh, probably dying. And they have an argument, well, Tony's on the phone from somewhere else, but they have an argument, he tells him like to calm down, like be a friendly neighbor Spider-Man, don't go after these guys. Peter tries to warn him and uh, yeah, uh, it just escalates from there. So the Vulture is annoyed because uh, Peter's gone after the P Peter's gone after them and causes some trouble. The Vulture's annoyed and he kills the Shocker and then he gives the Shocker to the other guy. So the other guy is a Shocker now. So Peter goes to Washington for, de for the Decathlon but his secret mission is to go after the villains because he knows they're going to be there. Goes after him, is unsuccessful and then uh, he misses the Decathlon and uh, he, his friend had a, had a Jatari weapon. Um, they didn't know it was a weapon, but he, he has a bomb and um, it accidentally goes off an elevator and Pete has to go save him, of course. That was a cool scene, elevator scene. That was, it, it was done well, how he saved all of them and how he saved his love interest, Liz. That, that, that was done really well. By the way, the Captain America TV series, the TV uh, cameos, the two cameos in, those, in, the, in the movie, that, that was done pretty well. Anyway, he saves Liz and then he, he finds out who the Vulture is at, at the ship, or on the ship I mean but b before he finds that out he interrogates uh, uh, what's, what's the guy's name? I don't, know his, I don't know the guy's name but he mentions the nephew and I'm pretty sure that nephew is Miles Morales so I'm guessing they will introduce Miles Morales very soon anyway you get the whole ship sequence a cool action scene but um, because Peter went after them uh, because of him, um, he he doesn't understand what he's dealing with, so it tears apart the ship, the Jatari weapons, and uh, the Vulture gets away, but yeah, Peter tries to hold the ship together, it doesn't quite work out, but Tony, of course, comes in to save the day, this time he's actually there, so yeah, um, he tells Peter off, and he says, I need the suit back, 
you, you shouldn't be wearing this. And Peter's like, I, I'm nothing without the suit. And Tony says, if you're nothing without it, then you shouldn't have it. And yeah, that, that's kind of true. That's very, very true. Also, the whole time, the FBI were on the ship. They are on the ship trying to stop it anyway. So Peter kind of like messed with that as well. And Tony actually listened to Peter earlier on when he said, listen to me. Tony did listen to him and he called the FBI. But Peter messed it up, so yeah, there's that as well. But although there's no guarantee we'll call him, but still. Then he's got a date with Liz for homecoming, the homecoming dance. And he goes to their house and he finds out this was a crazy moment. I remember seeing this in the cinema for the first time. I was like, whoa, whoa, that reveal though. His love interest, Liz, in this movie, her father is the villain, is Vulture. How crazy was that reveal, man? That was done so well. That was done so, so well. And then he takes them to homecoming dance, of course. Peter, the whole time, he's, he's sweating. He's like, he's not sweating, but he's on a serious face. He's like, oh my God. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't know what to do in that situation. And um, yeah, then they have a conversation. Um, it goes the wrong way. And Vulture finds out that Spider-Man is Peter Parker. He, he finds out his identity right there, just from talking in the car. And uh, he figures it out and um, he threatens him at the end, like he tells this to get out, of course, she goes to the dance. He threatens Peter and he says, show my daughter a good time and forget about all of this. Or he will kill him and everyone he loves, so Aunt May as well. So uh, that's a serious threat, but Peter's like, nope, I gotta go after him. And you get this whole final uh, final sequence of him chasing the vulture, taking on the trucker, chasing the vulture, getting caught, but getting back up through, through a building who he collapsed on him. Peter getting back up going off to Vulture who's going to steal from Tony Stark uh, Tony Stark's moving wherever he's moving I don't know but there's a Quinn jet leaving with Tony Stark's stuff and uh, Vulture goes after that Peter tries to stop him and uh, yeah you get that whole final sequence then you get them fighting as well then Vulture's about to die Peter saves him when I first saw it I was in Dubai and I was half asleep when I first saw it like I remembered most of the movie but the, the final battle sequence I was half asleep for my eyes were closing constantly not not because I wanted to but because I barely had any sleep I had like three hours sleep in the previous two days so I, I was I was like struggling struggling to stay up <laughs> and I stayed up for most of the movie but then the end battle half of it I was asleep and I was <laughs> that's the first time I ever fallen asleep in a movie for a good movie as well it's not even boring I've seen some boring movies never fallen asleep but for this because I was so tired I just fell asleep, but yeah, I saw it for the second time when I got back to England in IMAX and yeah, it was awesome seeing that for the first time, even though it was the second time I saw it, but the first time seeing that fight scene and yeah, the third time seeing it, because it was the third time I'm pretty sure, seeing the movie, the fight scene is just as good. The fight scene is just as good. The funny thing is, I fell asleep in 4D. Think about that for a second. 4D, the most active type of cinema, you'll see it for moves, it sprays water on you. I fell asleep in that. What on earth? But yeah, um, still, um, that, that was a fun scene. And uh, yeah, um, Peter catches Vulture, which impresses Happy, impresses Tony. And yeah, he eventually, am I missing anything here? Wait a second, have I gone too far? I have gone too far, sorry. I've, I've, I knew I forgot something. Liz has to leave town because she's found out who her dad is. She's leaving to Oregon, I think, with, with her mum. So yeah, his love interest is gone. And then Zendaya's character, who's called Michelle, She's uh, revealed as MJ. MJ is of course short for Mary Jane, which is uh, well, Spider-Man love interest in the comics, in the movies, previous movies in DC. The thing is though, like, I like Zendaya. She, she's fine, but why don't you just call her Mary Jane? What's the issue with that? Why call her Michelle? I don't understand. Just just call her Mary Jane. Does, isn't that, doesn't make it simpler? Doesn't that make it simpler? Does I don't understand why she's called Michelle. Maybe, maybe yes, since she has a second name called Mary. I, I don't flipping know. But yeah, um, I don't mind her anyway. So it's completely fine. And um, yeah, Spider-Man: Homecoming two is coming uh, after Infinity War, I think. So I'm excited for that as well. Actually, it's after Avengers four. Yeah, not after Infinity War. It's Infinity War, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Captain Marvel, Avengers four then Spider-Man. I'm pretty sure. Anyway, Peter goes to meet Tony. He reveals a new suit for him. Obviously, he rejects it. He rejects place in the Avengers. He rejects the suit, but obviously, we know in Infinity War from the trailers that he actually gets the suit eventually. So yeah, there's that as well. But for now, it's a good moment, you know. 
Tony's been telling me this whole time to stay stay low. To do stuff on a small scale, if that makes sense. I'm thinking the right word. I should know I should know I don't know what I'm talking about. But um yeah. He wants to continue being who he is. Very neighbor with Spider Man ETC. He doesn't want he's not ready for something like that, a big step up like that yet. And he rejects it. And yeah, um that scene is uh it's done pretty well. So yeah, Pepper's back. Pepper Potts, obviously. Uh, I don't know what happened with the actor. I think there's some uh, disagreement or something. I, I don't even know what happened with the actor. But Pepper Potts, obviously a popular actor. She came back for Spider Homecoming, so we, we know they're back together now, and we know the actor is back for for who knows how long. She's probably in Infinity War as well. He comes and says, "Where's the kid gone? We're gonna make an announcement. We're gonna reveal the new Avenger to the public." But um, Spider Man's obviously <laughs> he is gone. I think in a way that's a reference to when they reveal Spider-Man in the comics in the Civil War storyline. Maybe it's just me. But yeah, um, they need to announce something because uh, people are there and uh, they ask Happy, Happy Hogan. Um, Tony asks if he still has, he still has a ring or whatever. And um, Happy says, I've been carrying this since 2008. And I'm thinking like, he said, I've been carrying this since 2008, carrying this ring. I know there's no, like, no relevance to the MCU, but... He was the director that did Iron Man. He started off the universe. Obviously, he stars in the movies now with Iron Man, but... John Favreau, he's the one who started off the universe in 2008. So I'm thinking, like, when he says he's been carrying this, this wedding ring since 2008, he was referring to where he started it all from, that he started it all. I, I don't think know. Maybe I'm reaching. Maybe I'm reaching, but... I don't know, it just sounded like a reference, I thought I'd say it. And then um, you end with Aunt May finding out that Tom is Spider-Man. <laughs> she sees him taking his uh, taking his suit off. Interesting ending. It's very different as well. This is like the first time she doesn't know who Spider-Man is. He, I mean, this is the first time that she knows who Peter Parker is Spider-Man. So I'm looking forward to how that works in Spider-Man 2. I'm really looking forward to that. So yeah, there's that as well. And the off credit scenes, the first one, Vulture in prison. Uh, one of the other villains, in, also in prison, uh, from the ship scene, asked him, apparently you know who uh, Spider-Man is, because they're looking for him, they want to kill him. And Vulture's like, if I knew who he was, I would have killed him already. Now he's protecting Spider-Man, he's protecting Peter, why? Why is he doing that? Doesn't he hate Peter? But I don't know, M maybe uh, maybe he likes the kid, maybe he respects the kid, I guess. Or maybe he knows that Peter saved his life, maybe he knows that, maybe he's thinking like, he saved my life, I'll save his. You get the second after credit scene which you wait ages for. Um, in the cinema you do anyway. In this you just fast forward. But um, in the cinema you wait so long and then you just get to America again for the third time just talking some nonsense. It's quite funny though. He talks about patience. You wonder why you waited so long for something so disappointing. And that quote just takes the piss. Like at least it's funny to be fair. <laughs> but you waited so long for some sort of reveal or something. You get that. And uh, yeah, um, he he does that. He does that in a funny way. And yeah, that was a uh, some cool cameos in there, cameo scenes. That was good. Yeah, I think it was nice to introduce like Spider-Man in this way because even though it's a popular character, this is the third Spider-Man reboot in what since 2000. So people they want to make people care about a third Spider-Man, a different Spider-Man to Andrew Garfield to uh, to Lou Maguire, they want to make him a good popular Spider-Man and obviously it's an MCU movie so that helps a lot as well that helps a lot to uh, elevate the character but I like that they used Tony Stark I like that they used Iron Man because he's a popular character he's very popular he's one of the most popular characters in, in the MCU why wouldn't you use him to introduce a new character in? I think that was a smart choice because I think that, that probably got more people to go and see it in my opinion and also Captain America in there as well, um, in the movie, that also helps as well, push, push the character and uh, get him, in wrestling you say get him over, get, get the fans to love him more, but yeah, I don't know what, you, what term you use for movies, but yeah, you know what I mean. And yeah, um, an all round good movie, an accurate Spider-Man and, forgot to mention at the start, a very good villain. This is the first good villain they had since Loki. Loki was the only good villain for me in the first two phases. Easily. Everyone was bad. Everyone else was bad for me. Although they, they got to build up to Thanos eventually though. So no villain can really be that good, I guess. It, they're limited in a way because they got to carry the plot forward of uh, getting to Infinity War. But 
still, you know, you can still make a good villain. And uh, with Vulture, with Vulture, they did that really well. And um, from this point on, they've only had good villains. When you think about it, Vulture, good villain. Hella, good villain. Killmonger, good villain. Three movies in a row now with good villains. This bodes well for Thanos. Thor Ragnarok, episode 17. You know what? I love the colour scheme. Not not just the cover, but the colour scheme of the movie as a whole is really good. It's like the most colourful movie in Marvel Universe. Yeah, so this was a great movie. This was a great movie. Obviously, they overloaded it with comedy. Um, a lot of comedy in this. A lot of people have an issue with Marvel when they uh, put a lot of jokes in their movies. But um, for me, I don't mind as long as the movie's good. And this movie was good. It, it was just a great, <laughs> it was just a great uh, fun movie to watch. And yeah, um, it starts off with, uh, wait, first of all, let me rate it, 9 out of 10, 9 out of 10. Very good, not the best Marvel movie, but definitely up there. Um, although sometimes the jokes were too much, like, there were a few serious moments which were, which had jokes at the end, and I felt that that wasn't needed, but the comedy was fine, I could look past it, because a lot of it was funny to be fair. You get the first opening scene with Thor and Surtur, Surtur obviously is a prophecy that he will destroy Asgard, and uh, Thor has that battle sequence. That's a cool battle sequence. It's, it's just so cool. And then, and then Thor finds out that Loki is posing as Odin on Asgard. Obviously, at, at the end of Thor: The Dark World, Loki's taken over Asgard. He's disguised as Odin, and he's sent Odin to Earth. So Thor and Loki they go to Earth. Loki's there's a care home there, and they don't find him. Doctor Strange comes in. Loki obviously casts a spell on Odin to stay on Earth. O o Odin broke free of it, but he chose to stay on Earth. In Norway, Doctor Strange found him for them. He sent them to Norway doing his uh, sorcery magic thing, which was pretty good. Some pretty cool scenes there. Then um, they talked to Odin. Odin talks about Ragnarok. It is here. She is coming. Hela is coming. Hela? She wasn't just any villain. She was their sister. The sister of Thor and Loki. How, <laughs> how crazy is that? Thor! Family feud. Obviously Odin dies, then Hela arrives. Hey, that rhymes. Anyway, Hela arrives. You get that sequence in the Bifrost. They're coming up, obviously all three of them, and uh, Hela gets rid of Thor and Loki, halfway through the Bifrost, they get knocked out, sent wherever. They sent to the Grand they're sent to the Grandmaster's uh, planet. And uh, Thor gets captured, he finds out well he, he gets captured by that by Valkyrie. Valkyrie sends him to the Grandmaster. Grandmaster has a thing called cost contest of champions. I don't know if that's a reference to the game or I don't flipping know, but he has a contest of champions in an arena and he's captured he captures warriors to take part in it he's captured thor but but valkyrie captured him for him and then he valkyrie's paid for that valkyrie turns out to be uh an asgardian as well who has run away after taking on hella obviously um you see in a flashback in the future in, in later on in this movie the valkyries they're an army of women army of asgardian women they take on Hela in a flashback and she kills all of them apart from her. So yeah, she's run away. Thor wants to get out and he sees Loki. He finds out Loki's been there for weeks. So uh, <laughs> Thor needs to somehow get out. Um, and Grandmaster says, if you can beat my champion, then you are free to leave. And uh, yeah, the champion turns out to be Hulk. And that is that is crazy. Before that, you meet Korg. Korg is a cool character played by the director. Uh, Korg was definitely one of the highlights of this movie. He, he was just awesome. He was funny. He was badass. He was cool. He was damn cool. Forgot to mention, Hela broke Thor's hammer. Why did I forget to mention that? <laughs> to break Thor's hammer, something that powerful, to just catch it and break it with your ha bare hands. That is just, that is power. While everything's happening on Sakaar, Grandmaster's planet, um, on the other side of the universe, I think, or how far away, he's far away. Asgard is taken over by Hela. She that that scene is badass. When she fights the whole Asgardian army, she just takes all of them out on her own. Also, I forgot to mention Stanley cutting Thor's hair. That was a I don't really talk about his cameos that much. He's he's, he's a cool guy. Turns up in every movie. That the, that cameo though was probably the uh, one of the most significant because he cut Thor's hair. That's <laughs> that's a major character's hair being cut. Iconic hair, cut by Stan Lee. So uh, you get that whole battle between Hulk and Thor. That was one of the best battles of the, of the movie. Probably the best fights in the movie, actually. The most enjoyable, at least. And, it, and you also get Hulk smashing Thor on the floor like, like it did to Loki. That was a hilarious moment. That's how it feels! <laughs> that was hilarious. And then Thor has his Raiden moment. Um, I say Raiden moment. I'm not a fan of Mortal Kombat, not really. I don't like the game, but um, I like the concept of it. And I know who Raiden is. And Thor, when he gets that lightning, get the Odin force I guess 
he has a proper Raiden moment. He looks so cool. So yeah, the fight's not too important, but Thor doesn't die, of course. He wakes up n near where we in, in Hulk's room, basically. He talks to Hulk. Hulk talks a lot more now, but he's been to Hulk for two years, and he's like a child. He has a vocabulary of a two-year-old, basically. So uh, yeah, he talks like a baby. He talks to Thor, quite immature, very immature, of course. He's, he's basically a child, even though he's not. He's basically a child, as the Hulk. Valkyrie and, well, he tries to talk to Valkyrie about escaping and helping Asgard. And, uh, well, she doesn't really agree, but she and Loki are sent by Grandmaster to find Thor and Hulk who have escaped now, who obviously Hulk has turned back. Now, where hasn't turned back yet? But after they escape, they get in the Quinjet. Um, he sees Scarlett Johansson, aka okay, Black Widow, on the screen, and Hulk suddenly, he turns back to Mark Ruffalo. Oh, I mean, turns back to Bruce ba Bruce Banner, I mean, sorry, Mark Ruffalo. Uh, obviously, he turns back to human form. He finds out that he's been the Hulk for two years and he didn't know, like, he was asking about Sokovia two years ago. Hulk and Thor have to escape. They get Valkyrie's help and Loki's help. And, uh, yeah, um, well, Thor, Valkyrie and Loki, they escape. Korg starts a revolution and uh, Korg finds Loki, who's on the floor. Obviously, Loki tries to betray Thor and, um, well, <laughs> Thor's having none of it, Thor executes him and um, well, Korg finds Loki and uh, Korg and his friends and Loki, they escape as well after, after Thor, Valkyrie and uh, and Banner. Bruce is now scared of turning back into Hulk because he's scared he might never turn back and uh, yeah, obviously that plays off as well. Obviously, and yeah, and Thor, Banner and Valkyrie, they escape in, gra in the Grandmaster's orgy ship Orgy ship, yeah, you heard that right. They get to Asgard to take on Hela, obviously. Um, Heimdall's already there. He's trying to, um, he's stolen the Bifrost sword to stop Hela's plans. He obviously has to save, he's trying to save the people. Obviously, the other three arrive. Thor's going to take on, take on, uh, Hela. Hela takes out his eye, and, um, Valkyrie tries to help the people of Asgard, trying to escape through the Bifrost. But they are stopped by zombie, by Hela's zombie army and a zombie wolf, yeah. I forgot to mention that there's a giant, there's a giant zombie wolf in this movie. How awesome is that? It's only there for like five minutes, but still, how awesome is a giant zombie wolf with green eyes? That's what I'm talking about, mates. Anyway, the wolf and the zombie army they're trying to take. This feels like Game of Thrones in space in a way, because there's there are zombies and it looks like a Game of Thrones sort of look, but in space. <laughs> that, that's that's like I, I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. But yeah, they trap the people as guards on the Bifrost, but Banner, he turns into Hulk eventually, of course, <laughs> saves the day, so, I mean, he takes on the wolf. Hulk fighting a, a massive zombie wolf is uh, kind of awesome. Even though it's only, like, only for like two minutes, it's still awesome to see, like, it, it wasn't even two minutes, it was like 30 seconds, but it was still like, I wish it was longer, but it doesn't need to be longer, but still, it, it was pretty cool seeing him take on a giant zombie wolf. And then Korg and his friends and Loki, they arrive on Asgard. Loki is not all bad. I mean, he is still evil. I mean, he's done a lot of evil things, but he cared enough to come back to Asgard and help the people escape. And yeah, him, Korg and Korg and friends, they, they all help try and fight off the zombie army, but Hela's obviously so powerful. Thor lost an eye. I think I mentioned that. I'm, I'm just, Hela takes away Thor's eye. He has a flashback with his dad and he talks about how he's not strong enough and his dad says are you Thor god of hammers because Thor told him that he lost his ammo he's not strong enough are you Thor god of hammers no it, it was it was to help control your power it was never the source of it he has a proper raider moment that they, <laughs> that, that's what I can, can compare it to because when you when you look at the scene you know what I mean it's a proper raider proper powerful moment and it's really cool you know so they realize that they can't actually stop Hela they gotta get everyone out they get all the Asgardians off off Asgard and Thor tells Loki go to the chamber and unleash Surtur from the start of the movie his crown is in the chamber go unleash him and Loki goes to unleash him and he also of course in also in the chamber is the Tesseract the Infinity Stone the first one to show up obviously in Captain America first Avenger Loki sees it, you don't see him take it, but you just know he took it. But yeah, anyway, he sets off, he, he sets up Terta, he unleashes Terta. And uh, yeah, um, the final battle is not really Thor trying to take trying to take on Hela. It's Hela versus Serta in a way. Hulk tries to fight Serta. Um, <laughs> and Thor's like, no! We gotta fulfill the prophecy. Asgard is not a place, it's a people. We've saved the people. 
Let's not let's let him destroy Asgard. <laughs> okay, Hulk, stop fighting him. Although, yeah, the, it, it's kind of crazy though. He saw that giant monster like devil like thing, and he just jumped in there with no fear whatsoever. Thanos starts his quest when Asgard falls. That makes me think, you know, like surely Serta also like he he can't die until he's destroyed Asgard, and, and I'm assuming that he dies with Asgard. So Serta is gone. Odin is gone. Now these are well, Odin especially is someone who could stop Thanos, and the Asgardian army can actually take out the Black Order. And now they're gone. Maybe this is why Thanos moves now, not just because of plot the convenience, but because. Maybe he knows about Asgard, about how powerful it is. Also, the Ancient One in Doctor Strange, she's very powerful as well. She's dead. And she could stop Thanos potentially. She's, she's very powerful. But now she's gone as well. And I'm pretty sure they said at the end of the movie that now that she's dead, the signal will be sent out to, to lots, of, lots of enemies out there in the universe and the cosmos. That could include Thanos. And there's even more things, like Ultron, if he was still alive, he could potentially stop Thanos. You know, you you know what I mean. Like he's not as powerful, but you know what? Ultron, Ultron, Ultron is potentially like very, very powerful. Like a lot more powerful than what we saw in Age of Ultron. Maybe he could have stopped Thanos. Maybe Thanos knows that he's gone as well. That Ultron like would have like faced him off. I think if Ultron was still alive, even though he's a villain, I think he would have turned. I think he would have faced Thanos. Honestly, I think he would have uh, faced him. And then um, there's also Hydra as well. And you're wondering, why am I mentioning Hydra? Well, if Hydra was still standing, they probably could have, like, mounted a good defense against Thanos as well. I'd, I'm just making stuff up now. Make, but there are a lot of powerful beings and groups that could have rivaled Thanos' army that are now gone. And maybe this makes Thanos think, okay, now the, all of these powerful beings are gone. And Ego as well. Ego. Ego's gone as well. I am T'Challa, the Black Panther. There are quite a few few people who said it was the best movie since, best superhero movie since The Dark Knight. Best superhero movie from Marvel. Best movie of all time, superhero movie of all time. Best MCU movie of all time. I think those are exaggerations in my opinion. Now I'm not downplaying Black Panther. I still think it's a great movie. It's an amazing movie, Black Panther. It's, it's brilliant. But I think best of all time, is exaggerating. I think best MCU movie is exaggerating as well. Best super movie of all time since The Dark Knight. I think that's exaggerating as, exaggeration as well, in my opinion. Okay, it's just my opinion, guys. Okay, so don't attack me. If you think it's the best, if you think it's the best of all time, that's fine. That's fine. You, you can think that. It's your opinion. Anyway, uh, on to the spoiler talk because I did love this movie and I want to talk about it. When you see it for the second time, you always miss some but you always realize you just you miss some bits out because when you see it the first time you just you, you enjoy the movie you think of the first time but when you see it for the second time you know what's coming so you pay more attention to the dialogue and stuff and I, I was like wait he said that she 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 did that you know it's a lot of things that you didn't notice the first time which is which is really good and yeah and the movie was uh amazing both times of seeing it it was just i saw it both times on IMAX by the way so that helps I want to see it in 4D. I might see it in 4D. Might be worth it. This takes place a week after Civil War. About a week. Yeah, it starts with... It doesn't start at the beginning. Like the second or third scene. There's a news report saying a week ago um, the UN... You, you know when the UN blew up in Civil War? Yeah, a week after that. So it's in the time frame of Civil War in a way. So I don't know when he went to the airport to fight in Civil War. Don't know if that was in the middle of the movie. I mean, they didn't, they didn't show that obviously, but he might have. That might have been in the middle of that. It, it was. It was in that area. So there's a scene when T'Challa's dad, in 1992, in the past. It starts with that. It starts with a scene in the past in California. He sent uh, his dad to T'Chaka. Uh, sent his uh, brother as a spy and sent someone else as a spy to do some work, etc. And it turns out his brother was helping Claw. He helped Claw steal, steal vibranium and kill a lot of people in Wakanda and T'Chaka found out about that and he said you have to answer for your crimes okay so remember that because that is a key part of the movie and then you get that fight scene in the jungle that you see in the trailer it's in Nigeria um, he has a bulletproof suit so he's not really in trouble here he just is pretty easily it's a really cool fight scene but you know nothing's gonna happen to him he goes to Nigeria to get Nakia after fighting those guys off he gets Nakia who is his love interest his ex at the start of the movie, but his love interest uh, because he's going to become king. 
and he wants her to be there so that's why he's gone down she was actually on a spy mission they were transporting girls along along the road to i don't know slavery probably i, I don't know uh, nakia was in the truck back of the truck with a lot of other girls she was a spy trying to get into and stuff but uh uh, to try to mess that up, mess the mission up, so that she could be there uh, for his uh, crowning of king. The Jabari, I think that's what they're called, the, the, the Jabari, the leader in Baku, he came down to challenge him to a fight. Like, he has to win this fight to be crowned king. He can't just be crowned king just because his dad died. No, he has to win a battle against whoever challenges. And in Baku, um, he beats him uh, pretty, it's pretty quick, he, he taps out eventually. T'Challa basically begs him to tap out because he doesn't want to kill him. You, you, you either win by tap out or you, you, you kill the guy. By the way, before the fight, um, T'Challa gets his powers taken away from him. He has to drink something and he takes his powers away just so the fight is like, he, he has to fight without his powers basically. Um, then he wins, he gets his power back, then he, he goes in this little pit, I don't know what it's called. I don't know what it's called, he goes in a little pit. They bury him in it, and then he wakes up in... Is it heaven? I, I don't know. I, it has a name. I'm sure they mentioned it, but his dad is there. All the previous Black Panthers are there, and he speaks to his dad. Like, it's not just like a vision or a dream. He actually speaks to his dad. Let's move on to T'Challa's sister, Shuri. She is a cool character. She's one of the best characters in this movie. Just watch the movie, and you'll see what I mean. Um, it's the stuff she creates. She, she's like a female Tony Stark, but smarter, a lot smarter and younger as well. She, she made new shoes, right? New Black Panther shoes, and uh, they make no sound at all. Well, well he, he can step, there was no sound. And, and she said, you know what I call them? Sneakers. And I don't know why. I mean, it's kind of cheesy, but it made me laugh. There's this guy, what's his name? The guy who protects the border. What's his name? The Shepherd. I think he's, he's not called the Shepherd, but. He's um, a Koye's lover, whatever his name is, he owns those rhinos, okay, yeah, yeah, there's a guy who owns rhinos in this movie, okay, let's just carry on, okay, this guy, um, when uh, Tishaka's brother helped Claw, helped Claw steal Wakanda and kill people, um, this guy's parents were killed, so he wants revenge, he wants Claw to stand trial or die or whatever, and uh, they find out that Claw is in South Korea uh, with, well, Killmonger's there as well, but you'll see him eventually. Oh yeah, I forgot the London scene. The London scene, the Claw and Killmonger, they helped steal an artifact. I don't know why they mentioned that. There was no need to mention that. They steal, uh, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. They steal a Wakandan artifact. Uh, uh, <laughs> they steal a Wakandan artifact, I'm sorry. I don't know what I'm saying anymore. They steal a kind of artifact from a British museum uh, to sell it to the CIA. I don't know why it was to the CIA, but it was the guy from Civil War. What's his name? Played by Bilbo, Bil Bilbo Baggins from Lord of the Rings. What's his name? Martin Freeman. Yeah, he was in Civil War. He, he's in this movie. Um, but yeah, Claw is in South Korea. Uh, T'Challa takes Okoye and Nakia to... Um, Okoye is the general, by the way. She's, she's the one who wears red. She's the one who plays Michelle in The Walking Dead. That, that is Okoye. Um, Okoye and Nakia go to T'Challa to South Korea to, to the place of the deal where the deal is being made uh, with Claw. And it's Martin Freeman's character, CIA, who's actually buying this piece of equipment. I don't know why he's buying it. I guess for research purposes or something. I do not know. But um, yeah. Uh, Claw manages to escape, but there's a big chase scene, as you see in the trailers. It's a really cool long chase scene, don't need to mention it really. It's just a really cool long chase scene, basically. And it ends with um, Claw in custody with uh, the CIA. And uh, they argue over who gets custody, like, we, we want to take him back to Wakanda, but Martin Freeman's like, no! No, he's, he, he's in our custody now. And there's a bit of banter there. But yeah, eventually, um, Killmonger and the crew there's a little crew there, there's like four people. They break Claw out and he gets away. He gets away. Martin Freeman's character almost dies, he gets shot. And uh, they need to take him back to Wakanda to uh, to save him. Of course, they do not have Claw. And the guy who's a shepherd, what's his? Oh yeah, I've got his name right here, Wakabi. Yeah, Wakabi is his name. The guy's parents were killed when Claw stole uh, Vibranium. Um, he is not happy because T'Challa did not bring Claw back to Wakanda 
uh, T'Challa promised him that he would bring Claw back to Wakanda to stand to stand trial, but he didn't deliver. And um, it, it's not really his fault, to be fair. It's not it's not T'Challa's fault, but Wakabi sees it as his fault. You know, he said for thirty years your dad did nothing. I thought for you, with you, be different. I'm like, calm down. Calm down. He had one attempt. He had one attempt. It was like, what, his first week in charge of the country. He had one flipping attempt. That doesn't mean he's going to fail again. Jesus. That's that's one of the things, like, um, I said the movie, the movie is very good. But I felt that was a little bit like, <sighs> come on. Come on. How can the character be like that? Come on. He, you got to look at it from uh, T'Challa's perspective. Oh my days. He's only been there a couple days. You expect him to bring Claw back straight away. Anyway, um, <laughs> I just got a bit annoyed with Wakabi because uh, I felt that his views could have been... I mean, I get that he wanted Claw badly, but T'Challa had one attempt. Why, why Wakabi? Kill Munga! Kills Claw. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not taking a mick here. He, he, he kills the crew. He kills... Uh, some guy who's with him, I don't know who he is, just some guy who's with him. And the woman who's with him, there's a woman who's with him, uh, who he's, uh, I, I thought it was a love interest actually, but uh, he, he just killed her. He, 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 he just killed her. And then he killed Claw. <laughs> and then it's revealed that it's Reconnan as well. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, when the Claw's being broken out, uh, T'Challa noticed Killmonger's necklace. It was a it was a common necklace. He knows the ring as well, a Black Panther ring necklace and stuff. So he went back to Wakanda and he went to. <sighs> I keep forgetting everyone's name. Who is what is this guy's name? How did this guy have this ring? My grandfather's ring. I am your king. You better tell me. So he tells him, right? And then you get a flashback back to that scene from the beginning uh, with his brother. You you'll be arrested for your crimes and stuff. His brother tried to kill, oh my god, what's his name? Zuri! Yeah, that's it, that, Zuri. I knew that. I did not check IMDb, okay? Shut up. Okay, Zuri is the guy I'm on about, okay? Zuri was the other guy who was there with T'Chaka and, um, I don't know what his brother's name is. Just forget about his brother, okay? So his brother, because he was getting arrested, he tried to shoot Zuri. And because of that, T'Chaka, T'Challa's dad, murdered his own brother to save Zuri and it was emotional but then they reveal something Zuri, no Zuri, not Zuri, sorry T'Chaka's brother's son aka T'Challa's cousin was there he wasn't there in the room but he was there on the ground playing basketball he looked up, saw a kind of ship disappear he knew something was wrong, ran up he's a little kid by the way he ran up, he saw his father dead and that is Killmonger. T'Chaka killed his dad, then left him with nothing. He didn't take him back home. He had to maintain the lie. He left his brother's son with nothing. Absolutely nothing. And Killmonger, obviously, he becomes Killmonger. He joins the army for whatever reason. Goes to Afghanistan, Iraq, kills people for fun. He's got a mark for every kill he got. So in the trailer, you see all those marks on his chest. And um, that's every one of his kills. Literally, he kills people, then he kills people for fun, then puts them as marks on his body. Crazy guy, but um, yeah, he comes to Wakanda. He kills Claw with his with his body. Comes to Wakanda. He gets Wakabi on his side, and he wants to challenge uh, T'Challa's uh, T'Challa for his throne at the waterfall, just like in the first fight with Mbaku. This time, it's T'Challa versus his cousin, and. Uh, Killmonger kills Zuri um, and then kills, supposedly kills T'Challa. Um, I'm not going to mention like the whole fight, but that's basically what happens. They have a crazy fight. T'Challa gets the upper hand at first, then Killmonger kills Zuri, kills T'Challa, um, or supposedly kills T'Challa. Throws him in the waterfall. Everyone assumes he's dead. Um, and yeah, uh, Killmonger is the king of Wakanda now. And um, T'Challa's mother, sister, uh, Nakia, they all run away. Okoye stays because she's the general of the army and um, she is loyal to the throne, so she wants to stay. Even though she doesn't agree with Kumanga, she wants to, she, she's loyal to the throne. 
Wilma sits on it, she's loyal to that, so she stays. So eventually they go to the mountains, to the tribe that is not with them, who is uh, who's against everyone else, with M'Baku as the leader. Um, they go there, ask for help, because he's their only chance for an army. They have to go to the, to the enemy to, uh, help, to uh, fight an enemy, if that makes sense. If, if that, I, I, I don't know, but um, yeah, uh, they ask him for help and uh, he takes them, he takes them to, uh, oh I forgot to say, Killmonger, he burns the place where there are plants, uh, what are the plants called, it's the plants to give Black, Black Panther powers and um, he wants to burn it all to the ground because he doesn't want there, want there to be another king, he just wants it to be him. While he's doing that, Nakia steals one of the flowers just in time and gets out. Uh, she sneaks in, gets one, gets out. To, uh, just in case, you know, just in case. And she offers it to M'Baku. And M'Baku says, uh, follow me. And the child is alive. He's in a coma. He's, uh, M'Baku saved T'Challa. One of his fishermen found him on the shore and he saved T'Challa. And uh, the reason for that is uh, because T'Challa spared his life earlier in the movie. Against him in the fight against Mbaku, T'Challa was close to killing him, but T'Challa said, Yield, tap out. He doesn't say tap out, but he said, it's called yield. He, he says, Yield, your people need you, yield. He basically like um, spared his life. And Mbaku said, um, A life for a life, death is paid. Uh, but yeah, but before, that's before, before that moment though, T'Challa is in. Um, is it heaven? I don't know what it's called, okay? He gets angry at his dad for making this mistake and uh, he said he wants to be different. He needs to help. Uh, why did you leave him? Uh, why did you not help other people in other countries? Because Killmonger mentioned that, like, um, a lot of black people struggled, yet Wakanda thrived. Where was Wakanda when the blacks needed help in other countries? Like, where were they? They just stayed isolated, they didn't help everyone else. Kimaga made some points there. Like, it's, a, it's the most powerful country, Wakanda, in this universe. Why didn't you help anyone with any struggle whatsoever? That's, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty true, you know? Charlie realizes that. He realizes that during the movie. After what Kimaga says, after everything, after thinking about everything, he just, he realizes that it's, it's so true. It's just that Kimaga is going, going about it the wrong way. Kimaga wants to kill everyone. He wants to send weapons to London, New York and Hong Kong to start revolutions and overthrow governments, kill everyone in power, ETC, he wants to do all that, okay, so he has the right thoughts in terms of people need help and stuff, but he goes about the wrong way, he wants to murder people, which is, he, he wants to become the people who he hates, you know what I mean, he wants to become the oppressor. And Baku actually says no to helping them, he would not give them an army, he will not help at all, and uh, the scene just ended there, he just said, I will not help you to T'Challa, and the scene ended there. Then you get to the final battle, um, Black Panther is alive, he shows himself, says the challenge is not over, I did not yield, I did not die, so the fight technically should go on. So Wakabi and his men charge a Black Panther, and Wakabi gets his rhinos, he summons his rhinos with a trumpet, he sounds his trumpet, and his rhinos come out, crazy stuff. <laughs> Okoye, the general, and their army, they're trying to fight Killmonger. He kills one of them, which is a, a really sad, a sad moment. Uh, but there's a big battle going on, and then it looks like they're about to lose. But then M'Baku, suddenly, after saying no to help, he flipping comes in, he flipping helps, okay? And then uh, Black Panther sees his sister in trouble, his sister's fighting as well. She's in trouble with Killmonger, Killmonger's about to, ki about to kill his sister. T'Challa saves him, saves her just in time, and they get into a little fight. Why do I say little fights? They get into a big fight. The, the big fight between those two. And while that's all happening, Martin Freeman, his character, uh, he's uh, alive and well after they cure him in, in, the, in his sister's lab. Uh, with advanced technology. Um, there's this, um, what do you call it? There's like a BR thing in a way. Early in the movie in South Korea, T'Challa's sister was driving a VR car in a way. She was driving a real car, but she wasn't in the car. She was at the base in Wakanda, but it looked, but she was driving the car. I, I don't know, it's really cool, it's really cool. And in the same way, uh, Martin Freeman, he got in the ship, 
the, uh, Black Panther's ship, right? Uh, not actually in the ship, though. Like he he was in what what do you flip and call it? Should, should we just call it VR? Might as well just call it VR, even though there's no there's no headset on. He just, he just might as well just call it VR because he's not really in the ship, but he's in the ship. He's controlling it. So yeah, whatever you want to call that. But um, yeah, he has to take down the ships because Killmonger sends some ships to the outside world to um, f with weapons, powerful weapons to start war and stuff. And he has to stop those ships from escaping Wakanda. And he does that. He does that. And uh, eventually, Wakabi and his tribe they they give up. They kneel. And it all comes down to Black Panther versus Black Panther. Because they're both Black Panthers, T'Challa and Killmonger at this point, and um, the CGI is a bit off in that scene. To be fair, to be honest, is 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 very off, but um, not very off. But it's not it's not that bad. It's like it's not like it's not like ridiculous, but it's uh, it's still a good fight scene, and it ends with T'Challa stabbing him in the chest. And then uh, Killmonger, he made a lot of good points, by the way, as I said earlier in the movie about about help and other stuff like that. His dad mentioned how Wakanda was beautiful, Santa's a beautiful, everything like that. And um, he said he had his boy chasing a fairy tale. Can you believe that? And T'Challa was like, T'Challa took him, pick, pick, picked him up, took him up to the surface to watch the sunsets. And uh, Killmonger was like, wow. He really is beautiful. I can't remember the exact words, but that's about it. And T'Challa said, we can still heal you. Because T'Challa, he, he does kill. He kills when he needs to, but he doesn't like... If he, has, if he has a choice, most of the time he chooses not to. Because he doesn't like... He doesn't want to kill. But when he has to, he does. And he says to Killmonger, we can heal you. And this was probably the deepest line of the damn movie. When Killmonger said, Michael B. Jordan, by the way, great job. Great job, Michael B. Jordan. Fantastic job. But this line, this line, uh, he was like, um, I can't remember the exact words, but um, heal me. Why? So you can lock me up like my ancestors, something like that. And he said, bury me in the ocean with my ancestors who jumped from the ships because they knew that death was better than bondage. Damn, that was, the, that was deep. That that was very very deep. Apparently, he's quite a big nerd as well. I watched his, I watched a video recently of um, his knowledge of Black Panther, and damn, he knows his comics. I can tell you that he knows more than me. <laughs> That's for sure. Jeez, I love it. I love it. What's a guy? Shuri as well. Shuri, what whatever. What's the actor's name? Letitia Wright, right? Brilliant, brilliant. Chadwick Boseman, brilliant. Everyone else, brilliant. Literally, everyone was brilliant. Who who was bad? I don't know, the rhinos. I didn't like the rhinos, they were okay, I guess. I don't know why, I, I, I say the most random things. Anyway, um, very good movie, 8.5 out of 10. Uh, as for the after credit scenes, they weren't anything that special, I'm not gonna lie, but um, the first one was about Wakanda. T'Challa announcing the UN, Wakanda um, sharing their resources with the rest of the world. And uh, yeah, for the first time ever. And he mentioned how we all need to get along. Like, we all need to get along as if we were all the same. Which, well, that's relatable, you know, in the real world. You, you get you, you get racist people, you get ISIS, you get... Just people hate people for the colour of their skin or whatever. And no one realises that we're just all the same. We're just all the same. White, black, brown, gay, straight. Christian, Muslim, atheist. We're all human beings. After credit scenes, uh, the second one, by the way, I've got to mention, is it was Bucky. Bucky wakes up, he comes out, talks to Shuri about whatever. You've got a lot more to learn. That's it. There was nothing. I thought it was gonna show like Captain America or something. Just, just, show, just show someone else. I don't know. I think this was a bit too long, but um, I probably cut it down. Even if I do, it probably be still be too long. This is your boy David. Please like, share, subscribe. Thanks for watching. Have a good day. Let's see. Hey, he didn't. He didn't mention me. I I have to do the outro because because I am the chala, and I don't care what David says. Okay, this was the chala. Please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Have a good day. This is a terrible accent, but I don't care. See ya.